quickly, shall we? Father God, we recognize today as a day, it's your gift to us, and it's an opportunity for us to encounter you. And so we invite you to make yourself known to us during these moments that we share together in this room. Speak to us, impact us, influence us so that we will be more like Jesus as a result of having been here. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. And you can have a seat. Thanks so much for being here. We are focusing this day on our young people. We've got some of the teens that are helping in our worship this morning and providing the special music. We're also recognizing our high school graduates here in our first service. And so as we begin that, I invite you to focus your attention on the screen. I was thinking, we have the ABCs of graduates. We've got Adam, and we've got Ben, and we've got Cassie. And, and today, seniors, um, I just want to, on behalf of your church family, to join with all the friends and family members who have uh, expressed in recent days or will express in the coming days their, their congratulations and, and best wishes to you. And I'm sure as you've already heard, or if you haven't heard it, you are going to hear it probably before the day's over, that the word commencement, which you will experience here in a few hours, that word really means beginning. You know, when we think about graduation, we think about it as a milestone reached, or we think about it as an accomplishment achieved, but, but really a commencement marks the beginning of, of something. And there's a sense in which graduation from high school marks well, it marks the end of childhood and the beginning of adulthood. And you are entering a phase of your life, which is perhaps the most important phase that you will be ever entering and ever go through. And it is, I would say, dare say, more important than you can right now even fully appreciate or recognize. And I just wanted to say a few things to you this morning. As I was thinking about what to say, my mind went back to... Uh, to something I do every time I dedicate a baby. Um, and one of the things that I will do is that I will write a letter to that child and, and give that letter to the parents and say, would you someday share this um, with your child to explain why you did what you did today? And in that letter that I, that I write to the children, there's, there's a paragraph that I write that says, today, when that ceremony was over and your parents returned with you in their arms to their seats, I felt like I was watching a ship on a voyage out on a vast and uncertain sea. And your parents and your church will do the best that they can to protect you and keep you in the center of the fleet for as long as they can. But the day is going to come when you must hoist full sail and you've got to chart your own course. And I pray that when that time comes, that your vessel will withstand the storms and your rudder will hold true and you will realize just how dependable and how faithful the captain of our soul really is and how fully you can trust him. And so in many ways, Adam, Ben, Cassie, your graduation from high school marks that occasion for you. That day when you'll be called upon to hoist full sail and catch the wind for yourself. And we as a church family, we've tried to protect you and keep you at the center of the fleet for these years of growing up. Adam and Cassie, longer more so than Ben, because I know your family's newer to the church. But as you three move into the next chapter of your life, you're going to be asked to chart your own course. And my hope for each of you is what I stated in that letter that I hope it would be. My hope is that your vessel will withstand the storms. That your rudder will hold true. And that you will realize just how dependable and just how faithful the captain of our soul really is. And how much you can trust him. Perhaps the most important thing we ever learn in life is just how much we can trust him. Tanner, would you come forward this morning and pray a prayer of blessing for our uh, kids, and then we'll, we'll take care of that. Let me get you a um, microphone here, and this is, I don't have my glasses, so I can't tell which one this is. You know which one it is? I hope so. 
Let's pray. Dear Father, I just thank you for this time, God. I thank you for these students, Lord, um, that have spent the last 12 years of their life um, listening to teachers, getting in trouble, and doing sports, Lord. I just pray that uh, as they move on from here, Lord, I pray that you would take them and use them for your glory, Lord. Um, Father, that that they would know that, that no matter what their age, no matter what their intelligence, Lord, you chose to use the weakest of the weak to show your gospel, to share your story. Um, so, Lord, if I could pray one thing, I pray that they would not get caught up in the world today, that they would not get caught up in their own story, that their own story would not be bigger than yours. But, Lord, that they would know that you've chose them to be a part of your story, and they would live out that story, Lord. Uh, the fact that you came as their Savior, and that they would live that out with all of their friends, family, teachers, anyone they come in contact with, Lord, uh, co-workers. Lord, I pray that you would use them as a vessel and disciple them along the way with anyone that you choose fit, Lord. But God, I pray that they would know that they are valuable. Um, Lord, that, that they do have a purpose and that you want to use them. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. You guys can come on up. Yeah. Seniors. Cassie. <laughs> Let's make sure. Adam, yep. congratulations. Thank you. Blessings on you from your church family. Adam is graduating from Sandy Creek High School this afternoon. Adam Schaefer. Ben. Congratulations from your church family. I know you're newer to Lakeside, but we're so glad you're a part of our church family. We just want to say congratulations on this milestone, and we're with you, okay? And Cassie, I'll take, I'll take the post-it off of yours, but there's, there's girl stuff in here, so <laughs> we wanted to make sure we got this right. Cassie Harris. Congratulations to you on this incredible milestone. What a privilege it is to share and celebrate with you as you graduate. Ben and Cassie are both graduating from Hastings High this afternoon as well. So blessings on you. Good group of kids. And you'll look in your worship folder and realize there's other graduates as well. Um, William Dawes from uh, Bellevue? Wayne State, and, and Lisa Nonneman got a master's from, uh, from Bellevue, and uh, probably others that we missed as well, but congratulations, you can return to your seats. Thanks for being good sports and letting us do this for you. As I said, the, the teens are uh, assisting us in worship this morning. Um, and the things that they're doing are things that they uh, performed a few weeks ago at Max, which is uh, the regional uh, talent get-together at our regional university at Olathe, Kansas. And uh, these girls performed the, the drama that will be during the offertory. They performed and took second. And then Hannah McConnell, uh, she performed solo and actually took first with hers. So let's enjoy the kids as they, they minister to us. Girls, share with us. Thanks, teens, for Amen. leading us, Amen. helping us concentrate and focus on him. Thanks, Melinda, for letting me speak, not after the church shunned somebody, but after somebody got on their knees and found the power that <laughs> I was thinking, if we'd have inverted those things, it might have been really fun to get up here and say, okay, let's look at the Word of God. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for thinking that through. Uh, we are, we are uh, recognizing a number of things this morning. Uh, obviously, it is Mother's Day. 
Um, it is graduation day for our high school seniors. It is uh, promotion Sunday for our children here at church. That'll be happening during our second service this morning, and that's what these things over here are all about. A lot going on. And as a pastor, it's kind of hard to decide which one of these issues that maybe I should address or try to expand upon during the morning message. So I thought what I'd do is that rather than pick one and overlook the other two, I just overlook all three of them and uh, go a totally different direction. And in doing so, I want us to pick up a, a theme that I've been kind of hitting and missing on uh, the last few weeks. If you were here the Sunday after Easter, began an emphasis called Join the Journey, where, where I, I tried to paint a picture of what I believe that Lakeside can someday be and become, the, the church that, that God would have us to be. And, and I talked about the congregational purpose that, that we have, the, the reason for our existence, the fact that we exist to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. If you recall, I, I took a verse out of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It's a verse that talks about how the power that raised Jesus from the dead is active and living in us if we've placed our faith in Him. And I kind of thought, what would happen if we, what would happen if we as individuals, what would happen if we as a church corporately, what would happen if we were to leverage that power and really live it out? What would that look like? That's where we began. We had a couple of weeks break. We took one week to celebrate baptism, which is so cool, to hear the stories of God's transforming grace in the lives of people. And then we had David and Lisa Frisbee with us. And so a couple of weeks ago, we began to be picked up the journey and began to look into that purpose statement, to look at what it means more closely. We started by talking about what does it mean for you and me to be a follower of Jesus. If we're to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus, what does it mean to be a follower? And we talked about how following is not a casual endeavor. Following is not something that we can do in our spare time. Following involves allowing Jesus to shape and craft and sculpt our lives in enduring and meaningful ways. And then if you were here last Sunday at our second service, we took a break again because the children gave this their incredible presentation of Blast Off. During the first service, I tried to expand upon this idea a little bit. I went back to the story where Jesus called Peter and Andrew and said, I want you to, uh, to come and follow me, the calling of his first disciples. And I talked about how those two men had to drop their nets so that they could respond to Jesus' call and actually follow him. And I talked about what are some of the nets, what are some of the things in our day, in our lives, in this time, that sometimes we hold on to that we need to drop so that we can follow Jesus. If you weren't here for the first service, I think it's on the website, and so you can go listen to last week's uh, message during the first service if you like. But what I want to do this morning is I want to come back and resume um, our, our look at this statement, the Lakeside Community Church exists to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus. I want us to pick that up, and I want us to lock on this morning and, and really focus on what it means for you and I to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And, and I want to jump into this theme or this topic by, by, by saying this. That I think there's a lot of people in this world, there's a lot of folks around who think it's okay for people to be religious as long as we don't take it too seriously. You know, a lot of people treat issues of faith and treat religion like it's a hobby. You know, it's kind of been reduced to stamp collecting and building model airplanes or restoring classic cars or whatever other kinds of hobbies that we do. And when somebody starts to take their faith seriously, when somebody makes their relationship with Jesus the preeminent pursuit, the consummate quest of their life, there's other folks that get worried about that. 
When, when we allow our faith to influence our decisions and our lifestyle choices, when our faith begins to impact how we spend our money and how we raise our kids and how we vote and the kinds of entertainment that we avail ourselves to, there's a lot of people that get really, really apprehensive and nervous about that. And when they talk about us, they'll use words like fanatic, zealot, uh, extremist. Because we live lives of conviction and principle, they'll, they'll, they'll use words like narrow-minded. And here's one of the great ones in our day, intolerant. It's like they think that because we take our faith seriously, we're a bunch of wide-eyed crazies who've stored up enough food and water to last a year, and we've got an array of guns and bullets stuck away in our basement so that we can be ready when Armageddon hits. That's kind of the social image they have of people who take their Christianity seriously. And so when I sit there and say that our purpose as a church is to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus, some people get kind of nervous and edgy <laughs> with, with that kind of language. It's almost like they're thinking, you know, you guys as a church, you, what you need to do is you need to get these people kind of cleaned up a little bit. You know, get, get them so they'll be moderately religious. Do, do something to, enough to where they become a positive influence on the world around them. But don't ask them to be fully devoted. Fully devoted sounds too radical. It sounds too extreme. It sounds dangerous. So this morning, I want us to look at what it means for us to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Because I'm convinced that it's not a dangerous, radical, extreme thing. It is a beautiful thing when it's lived out the way Jesus meant for it to be lived out. And towards that end, I want you to, if you've got your Bibles, I want to direct you to a story in Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 14. If, if you don't have your Bible with you, I think the verses will appear on the screen as well. It's a story, it's an account that I believe gives an illustration of what it means for you or I to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's a story that picks up at verse 1, Mark chapter 14. Follow along with me, if you will. It says, Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. So while Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at the table at the home of a man known as Simon the leper. Man, that's a great nickname, isn't it? A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume that was made of pure nard. And she broke the jar and she poured the perfume out on his head. And some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. And I tell you the truth, wherever the gospels preach throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And then it says, verse 11, that Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this, and they promised to give him money. And so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. When I read those verses, I realize really that this is kind of a story within a story. Because this account opens with Mark mentioning that there's this longing on the part of the chief priests and the scribe and the religious leaders. There's this longing to capture and kill Jesus. 
It's shortly before the Passover feast. It's a time when Jerusalem would swell to, to many times its normal size because people from all over the surrounding region, they would come to the city for the festivities. And, and because of the influx of people, it, it would make for a security nightmare. Riots. Violence was, was, was common. I mean, we saw that same sort of thing kind of recently play out in the city of Boston. Boston. You know, it was Patriots Day. That was a big local holiday for, for, for Boston. It was a day where, where, where people from all over the country came for the running or, or for the, 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 the observance of, of the Boston Marathon. And it made for a very challenging situation from a security standpoint. And sure enough, somebody took advantage. Jerusalem during Passover ha had that same kind of feel, that, that same kind of atmosphere. And so that's why the religious leaders, that's why the chief priests, they're concerned about an uprising. You know, they, they want to seize the opportunity that Jesus being there for the Passover celebration presented to them, but they didn't want to do it in a way that would cause a reaction. They wanted to be disquiet. They wanted to be discreet. And so the account tells how they intend to pull that off down in verse 11. It says they lured Judas. He's one of Jesus' followers. He's growing increasingly frustrated with some of Jesus' choices and some of his decisions and some of his ways of going about things. So they lure Judas into their plan, and he agrees to betray and turn Jesus over to them. And so it's against this backdrop of scheming and plotting that there is this account of this incident that takes place at a dinner party hosted by a man named Simon the leper. And at this party, a woman does something that is, it's beautiful, but at the same time, it's really kind of unsettling. She's overwhelmed by the wonder of who Jesus is. She's, she's caught up with the thought of what he's done for her. And so she does something that is so excessive and so outrageous that many of those who saw it thought, that is downright foolish. But as I think about it, I think about what she did. I think what she did is a powerful expression of what it means for you or me to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. She gives us a concrete example of what full devotion looks like. Simon the leper. Actually, he was a former leper. As you know, in that day and time, if you had leprosy, you were kind of cut off from social contact with the rest of the world. So, so if the disease of leprosy had still been active in Simon's life, he wouldn't be hosting a dinner party and inviting people to come. So maybe he was a guy who'd been healed by Jesus. Likely, perhaps, we, we don't know. What, what we do know is that while Jesus and his disciples and other guests are enjoying a meal at his house, that this lady, who chances are was another one of the invited guests, that this lady breaks open this jar of expensive perfume and anoints Jesus with it. And what's unusual about this is, is, is not so much what she did. The anointing that, that during a special meal, that, that was a fairly common practice in, in that world. Sounds kind of weird to us, but that was a fairly common practice. So, so what's unusual is, 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 is not so much what she did. What's, what's shocking is the value and the worth of the oil that she used to do it. The passage says that the oil that she broke open and anointed Jesus with was pure nard. And nard is an extract that came from this rare herb that, that was found in India. In fact... This it is very, very expensive. A, a flask or a jar like she had was the type of thing that was often handed down from generation to generation. You know, this was the kind of the family heirloom that your parents would, would give you to say, uh, this, this can secure your financial future. 
You know, this is something that you might use to, to try to get ahead in the world or, or, or something if you ever found yourself in a tight place that you could go and sell and, and, and get yourself out of trouble and back on your feet. I mean, verse 5, if you look at the story, it tells us that those that are watching this play out, they recognize the value of what it is that she's doing. They said, you know, we could have sold this jar or this flask. We, we could have sold this for more than a year's wages. I mean, let me ask you guys something. When's the last time, out of sheer love for Jesus, that you gave him a gift that amounted to more than you make during an entire year? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I, I, I know for myself, I, I've, I've never done that. I've never done that. And, and please hear me, I'm not trying to say that, that this has set the benchmark or the standard for what it means to be a fully devoted follower, but I think it helps give us a little bit of perspective here. When you realize the extraordinary value, when you realize the monetary worth that this jar of perfume had, you, you realize this is an extravagant act that this lady's doing. This is a lavish thing. I mean, she took what was perhaps maybe the most valuable thing she had. She took what was maybe her most prized possession and she poured it out on Jesus. Jesus. And she didn't do it to impress anybody. She didn't do it so she could be recognized. She did because she loved him. And in that simple act, there's a level of devotion that's exceptional. There's a depth of love that is atypical. There's a degree of generosity that's extraordinary, that's uncommon. I mean, this lady, she is all in. On Jesus. In many ways, she's sacrificing her security. In many ways, she's, she's placing her future in jeopardy to express her love and devotion to Jesus. But you know, that's kind of the way it works, isn't it? That when you're deeply in love with somebody, you don't get hung up on the cost, do you? When you truly get a sense of who Jesus is and what he's done for you and you become fully devoted to him. When you go all in, you express your devotion and you will do it in ways that others look at you will say, that's extravagant. And they'll struggle to make sense of that. That they'll sit there and, and, and it won't add up to them. But the reason it doesn't add up is because they're not sold out. They're not all in. They're not fully devoted. And so you sit there and this lady does that and there's a reaction. And the reaction of those that observe the actions of this woman, it's predictable. It's understandable. I mean, they pick up their jaws from the floor and they think, this is unconscionable. That this is wasteful. This is outrageous. But you know what's a bit unsettling to me is that this reaction that we see isn't coming from the critics or the detractors that were mentioned at the front of the passage. I mean, this isn't like the time that Jesus and his disciples in the book of Matthew, they go to Matthew's home and they share a meal with him and his tax collector buddies and the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They're getting all hot and bothered because he's hanging out with people. He's enjoying the company of folks that they consider to be riffraff. This isn't that. Now, the reaction that we read about in this story, that's coming from his disciples. That's coming from the inside. Now, that's coming with the ones from the ones who've been hanging out with him for the better part of three years. That, that's coming from the ones that here in a few short weeks, he's going to turn the entire operation over to. He's going to entrust the mission that he's been about in the not-too-distant future to these guys. They're the ones that are reacting like this. They're, they're looking at what they've just witnessed, and they're thinking to themselves, what this lady's done is a stupid, impulsive waste. She's just flushed her future down the drain. 
I mean, at the very least, she could have sold it, this stuff, and given the proceeds to the poor. Let me tell you something. There's a sense when you and I become fully devoted to Jesus Christ that we open ourselves up to criticism. When we take our faith seriously, when we become extravagant in our devotion to Him, when, when, when we make our faith not this compartmentalized entity or this segregated thing, when we do that, we open ourselves up to misunderstanding. Because people that are guided by a life philosophy of selfishness, a life philosophy that promotes greed and measures one's importance by their net worth, they they will see self-sacrificing actions and gestures like this lady did. They'll, They'll see it in one of two ways. They'll either see it, number one, as something that is totally baffling or confusing to them. Or they'll see it, secondly, as an attempt on this person's part to gain their trust so that someday they can turn the tables and come around and exploit and manipulate and victimize them. I mean, why would anybody ever choose to deny themselves this way? Love always seems wasteful to those that don't love. There's a sense in which this action, in which this full devotion, it exposed the disciples. It exposed their insincerity. It exposed their pretense. It always exposes the pretense of those who are just merely religious. When people aren't fully devoted, they don't get the picture. Doesn't add up. When something's done out of extravagant love, when something is given out of full and complete devotion, that the gift giver, like I said, the gift giver doesn't stop to think about the price. And the reason the disciples, I'm convinced, responded the way they did, the reason they responded in this fashion, it's not because they were smarter than this woman. Now, if you'd asked them, that's what they'd have told you. But the reason the disciples responded the way they did is because even though they'd been with Jesus for the better part of three years, they weren't as all in as she was. Their response was not triggered by the fact that they were superior in wisdom. Their response was triggered by the fact that they were inferior in consecration and surrender. And Jesus hears the criticism. And he speaks up. And he says, what this lady has done is a beautiful thing. And he says, the poor, you're you're always going to have the poor with you. And, and, And hear me, folks. When Jesus said those words, he's not giving us an excuse to neglect the poor. What he's doing, what he's trying to do by those words is ensure that we've got first things first. I mean, clearly, if you look at the Bible, caring for the poor, it's an important issue that's revisited time and time and time again. I mean, one of the recurring themes in the Word of God is that one of the key ways that our relationship with Jesus expresses itself is through providing tangible help and assistance to the poor, to the downtrodden, to the orphans, the widows, the prisoners, people like that. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But what Jesus is challenging those people in that room, and by extension us, what he's challenging us is to make sure that we're fully devoted to him first. Because he's basically saying, only then can your expressions of love, only then can your expressions of devotion have long-term impact and force. Being a follower of Jesus, 
There, there, there's a whole lot more to that than just politely acknowledging his value. There, there's a whole lot more to that than a conditional acceptance of his authority. To be a follower of Jesus is not about picking up religion as a hobby. To be a follower of Jesus is not about putting a fish bumper sticker on your car. <laughs> to be a follower of Jesus is to be sold out and all in. And to let your relationship with him become the umbrella that casts a shadow over the entirety of your life. Every facet, every aspect, every single dimension of your life is colored and shaped by Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a man of extreme and extravagant devotion. A level of devotion that, that, that is such that it exposes the insincerity of others. That it causes some people to feel a bit threatened. To be a follower of Jesus is to relate to him with such a fixed sense of purpose that it opens you up to criticism from those that don't understand. But I believe it also engenders the respect of a skeptical world. And it also engenders the respect and the regard and the admiration of a heavenly father who is looking for his children to live out something that is genuine and authentic and real. And I'm convinced that in this day, in this time, in this culture that we find ourselves in right now, being a follower of Jesus is not going to cut it if we define following as the kind of thing that we do when we follow Cornhusker football. Or when we follow the trends of the stock market. Or when we follow who's been eliminated from Dancing with the Stars or something like that. The world doesn't need followers like that. The world needs followers like this anonymous woman that we read about in Mark 14. This woman who's sold out and all in, who's fully devoted, who is so appreciative of what Jesus has done for her and so bought into what he wants to do in this world that she's willing to give herself in ways that seem excessive and outlandish to those that are merely religious. We don't need more religion. We need fully devoted followership. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, these familiar words. He said them to his disciples. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It says that Jesus said that to his disciple. That word disciple means follower. And if we're going to be a follower, what he says in that verse is that that means we've got to, there's a willingness. We've got to have a willingness to pick up and carry a cross. And folks, carrying a cross isn't a casual endeavor. Carrying a cross isn't something that we can do in our spare time as a matter of convenience. To pick up a cross means that we're willing to do something sacrificial. That we're willing to do some things that other people won't understand and they won't get. To do some stuff that will appear extreme and extravagant to some folks... But folks, that's the kind of people God can use to change the world. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago. I'll say it again this morning. I want to give my life to something that can change the world. I want to be a world changer. 
And I want a pastor, a body of believers that wants to be world changers too. And the key to changing the world is you and I, each and every one of us, making a commitment to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's why that phrase is in our mission statement or our purpose statement. The Lakeside Community Church exists to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's the thing that will change this world. And with the help of the Holy Spirit and us being all in, we can change the part of the world we've been placed in. Let's stand, shall we? Join me in prayer. Father God, again, we are just amazed at the work of your Holy Spirit that you inspired a guy named Mark to capture a brief account of a meaningful story that took place a couple of thousand years ago and by that same Spirit you made it live and applicable and relevant for us right here, right now, today. Halfway around the world, 2,000 years removed and it's just as applicable for us as it was for them. Thank you for that work, Heavenly Father. But Father, we don't want this just to be information. We want, be this, we want this to be the seeds of transformation. And so I pray that the word that you've spoken today would be on soil that's receptive, that the seed would lodge at a place where it will go deep and grow roots and to where we can become not just casual adherents, but fully devoted followers of Jesus. So keep the conversation going in each of our lives. Speak to each of us about things that we need to do, changes we need to make, modifications, adjustments, tweaks that we need to engage in so that we can be that all-in sold out, fully devoted follower that you long for us to be. We're grateful, Father, for what you've done. We're grateful, Father, for what you're going to do. And so it's with confidence in that that we leave this place, thanking you again for your presence and asking your blessing as we go forward. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. People agreed and said, amen. amen. Moms, we've got a special gift for you. I want you to make your way by the Welcome Center and pick that up. Graduates, again, congratulations. Thank you. We're so excited for you. Have a blessed day as you go.